Okay, this is Dr. Krause with a Root Locus Lecture Supplement. I'm going to talk about angle of arrival and angle of departure, talking about complex departure from complex poles or arrival at complex zeros. And so hoping that my students, when they're done, will be able to use, to analyze uh, the angle of departure or angle of arrival uh, based on the angle criterion. And we're talking about um, pages 458 and 459. It really only, I think, the book only deals with the angle of departure but section 7.3. So the question we're trying to address is if we have complex poles or zeros, well, specifically start with how do we, if we have complex poles, how do we determine the path that the root locus takes as it leaves those poles? Or alternatively, if we have complex zeros, how do we determine the path that the root locus takes as it approaches those zeros? And this can be particularly critical. I'll do an example later on. But if I had, um, for example, just to kind of motivate this thing, a situation like this, um, do I depart this way or that way? Which of those directions I head can make a very big deal, uh, has a very big impact on uh, system stability. So I need to know, does my root locus look like this or like this? So call this kind of option one, option two. It's going to do one of those two things. And if it pursues option one, then we are heading toward instability. And so we've got to know how to analyze that system to answer that question. So just as an introductory example about how we're going to do this, um, consider this system which just has two complex conjugate poles which appear to be under damped. Let's do some quick. So omega n is going to be 2, the square root of 4. And then uh, 2 zeta omega n is equal to 0 0.8. So zeta is equal to 0 0.8 divided by 2 divided by omega n. And so it looks like zeta is 0 0.2. So we're talking about a radius of 2. I'm just, well, 0 0.8. So we're somewhere in there and there. And so we've got some different tools if we were trying to do a quick root locus sketch. Um, probably can guess how this goes, but just to be clear, the, the question that we're trying to answer, if I've got a point that is somewhere near this pole, where is it? And that will help me determine what angle does the root locus take as it's leaving. So if I find the angle associated with whatever this pole is that's near this other pole, um, if I can find that angle contribution, then I can take off. So um, figure out how this thing takes off. So I'm going to call this angle phi 2, and so if that's pole 2, whatever this point is, if it's near pole 1, phi 2 is going to be approximately equal to 90 degrees. And so I've got some kind of test point somewhere, and if I zoomed in, I've got an angle phi 1, or what we're going to call phi departure, and that's going to be the angle from this pole to the point that's near it. And phi 2 is going to be approximately 90 degrees no matter what. So we know that phi 2, if we think about our angle condition, it's the, we're subtracting the angles from the poles and adding the angles from the zeros, and there aren't any in this case, and that has to add to 180 degrees. And that could be plus or minus 180 degrees. So if I've got phi 2 at a negative 90 degrees minus phi d, is equal to, I'm going to set this to a negative 180. Then if I add 90 to both sides, we're saying that a negative phi d is equal to a negative 90. So if I multiply both sides by negative 1, we're saying that the phi d is a positive 90 degrees. So the angle of departure from this pole is a vertical 90. And so we're heading off that way. If we did the same analysis for this pole, um, let's sketch that up a second over here so we're not cluttering up that drawing. So now I would have a phi 1 that's equal to 270 degrees. And the question is, what is my phi d for this other pole? And so it, we're talking about a negative phi d minus 270 degrees is equal to plus or minus 180. So let's go again with minus 180 
add 270 to both sides, we're saying that a negative phi d is equal to a positive 90 degrees. And so it turns out that it departs, if I multiply both sides by negative 1, at minus 90 degrees. So phi d is minus 90 or plus 270. So we're heading off that way. So if I come back here and I want to sketch in my root locus, whoop, that's a terrible graph, a terrible sketch. Um, I know that I head off that way and I head off that way based on an angle of departure argument. So let's fill that in with a little bit of detail. Um, kind of already implied all of this. The angle criterion says that the angle from my zeros, which are positive, minus the angles from my poles, so the poles are in the denominator, so they're negative, has to add to plus or minus 180. Um, so when we're talking about a specific angle of departure, we're just going to leave that in as an unknown that we're solving for. We're going to find the angles from the zeros, the angles from the rest of the poles, and then solve for phi d. And so, obviously, you would subtract those across, you would add those across just like we did, and you would find phi d, the angle of departure from a pole, that way. Similar argument um, for an angle of arrival. If you had a complex zero and you need to know how does the root locus approach that zero, you would do the same thing. You would have an unknown psi of approach. You would find the rest of the zeros, the rest of the poles, use the angle criterion and solve for psi a. So relatively straightforward. Um, let's do another example. So here I've got, um, I think that's the exact same complex pole, complex conjugate pair of poles. And then I'm also throwing in a one, two, three pole at minus three. And so the question is, so first of all, we're just kind of doing this as a full review root locus example. We know that um, the part of the locus that's to the locus that's to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros is on the real axis is valid. Um, I'll get to, I'll throw another video up of this later, but part of why that works with the complex conjugate poles is that there's a phi one and a phi two from those two complex conjugate pairs that cancel each other on the real axis. So the question is again, how would I find the angle of departure from one of those poles. And so I would have now, let's call this a phi 2 and a phi 3, and then we're trying to find phi d. So we're trying to find that departure angle. And so the way we do that, it looks like phi 2 is going to be equal to 90 degrees in the neighborhood of that pole. Phi 3, I could do some trig and come up with an exact answer, but I'm just going to ballpark it at what looks to be 40 degrees if my sketch is reasonably well done. So, minus 90 minus 40 minus Phi D has to equal plus or minus 180. And so I'm going to add 90, I'm going to add 40, so that's 130. So a negative Phi D is a negative 50 degrees. So again, multiply three by negative one. It must depart at roughly 50 degrees. So I'm heading off like that. And that seems like eventually that means I'm gonna to head towards instability. So that's a danger I need to be aware of. And I can repeat that analysis, but it also always works out that a root locus is um, a mirror image about the real axis. So this must also head off like so. So that is, and, or we could just repeat the, well, let's do that real quick just to get comfortable with it. If I've got this guy, this guy, this guy, I would now have a phi 1 that was equal to 270, a phi 3 that is equal to minus 50, and I'm trying to find a phi d here. So negative 270 minus 50 minus phi d is equal to a negative 180. And so this is 320. I add that across. Um, <laughs> so, three, so 140, right? Um, so negative phi 
D is going to equal a... I really don't trust myself to do math in my head today. Um, so negative 180 plus 270 plus 50 is a positive 140. Okay, so I'm, I'm not as untrustworthy as I think. And so phi D works out to be a negative 140. That seems wrong. Um, really looking for a negative 50. Um, Oh, whoops, that's a problem. So this was a minus 50, but it's minus a minus, so this should actually be plus 50. So it's actually 180 plus 270 minus 50, which is in fact a positive 40? I am really screwing this up now. Did I screw this up initially? Oh, <laughs> so I'm also making my life complicated. Okay, so this was a negative 40 in my initial example, and I changed it to negative 50 when I did the negative example. So I'm just trying to make my life complicated. Um, so let's try that one more time. Sorry for the mistakes. So it's negative 270 minus a negative or plus 40 is equal to 180. And that, in fact does give me the positive 50 that I was expecting, which then gets turned into a negative 50 when we multiply through by negative one on both sides. So sorry that attempts to do a quick, simple example made this much, much worse. So we do depart at positive 50 from pole one and negative 50 from what I'm calling pole two, like so. And then you could go ahead and find the asymptotes and it would turn off that these are heading off like so at uh, the asymptotes I think are at plus or minus 60 degrees and the asymptote centroid would be somewhere around in there. So there are kind of asymptotes that they're approaching like that. Um, so not surprising. Okay, let's do at least one more example. Um, and so this is actually the numeric example of uh, the, the introductory sketch that I did. Um, well, close. I think I Maybe I screwed that up just a little bit. So I've got a, a cubic here, but it's got a pure integrator. So I can factor my denominator into s times s squared plus 0.08s plus 16 divided by, I'm sorry, with s squared in the numerator 0.1s plus 25. And so if I take my standard form and kind of analyze that, I'm going to get an omega z of equal to 5 and an omega p of 4. Um, so 2 zeta z omega z is equal to 0 0.1 and so zeta z is equal to 0 0.1 divided by looks like 10 so it is 0 0.01 pretty small and then zeta P is equal to 0 0.08 divided by 2 times 4, so also 0 0.01, also very small. So the we get this pure integrator, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, I don't quite have the scale here, so I'm going to draw this as, so there's a pole roughly right there, and a 0 right there and a pole roughly right there, and a zero right there. And so the key issue, if I zoom in on that just a little bit, is what is my angle of departure here and here, and or what is my angle of arrival at the zeros? And so let's take angle of departure for this guy. And so we'll have um, what I'll call, I guess I'll just call this one phi one. I'll call this one phi 2. I'll have an angle from this 0 that I'll call psi 2, and I'll call this one psi 1. And so if we start using our angle criterion on that information, what we're saying is that psi 1 plus psi 2 
minus V1, minus V2, minus Vd has to equal plus or minus 180. And so we're saying that uh, from the look of this, psi 1 is 270, psi 2 is 90. So 270 plus 90. And then I'm going to call this one, it's going to be more like 91, 92, but I'm just not going to worry about that. And so I'm going to say minus 90 for phi 1, minus 90 for phi 2, and then minus phi d is equal to, I guess I'll just commit to a plus 180. So this 90 and that 90 will cancel. 270 minus 90 is 180, so it's 180 minus phi d is equal to 180. Well, obviously I subtract 180 from both sides, multiply through by negative one, and phi d is equal to zero. Um, so the dangerous part about that is to recognize that when we're talking about the departure angle from this pole, so what we mean is that this thing is heading off this way, and it'll turn out we could also solve for the arrival angle of that zero, and it would also be zero. Um, let's prove that really quick as an example. Um, blank piece of paper. So if I decided that this psi one was now the psi a that I'm gonna solve for, then what we would say is psi a plus psi two minus V1, minus V2, minus V3 is equal to 180. Um, if this is the very top one, then that's 90, that's 90, that's 90, that's 90. Everybody's 90. I mean, Psi A is unknown. So Psi A plus 90, minus 90, minus 90, minus 90 is equal to plus or minus 180. And so again, that cancels and I'm left with psi A minus 180 is equal to minus 180. And so obviously psi A also turns out to be zero. So that means that we depart this pole going towards uh, the positive real axis and we arrive at the zero from the positive real axis. And so that will in fact, if you were to go ahead and actually generate the exact root locus using um, MATLAB or Python or whatever, you would in fact get this picture and the same thing will work out over here. And so it will turn out that this is an unstable for most values of K. And so this uh, system is gonna need some kind of different control algorithm or bad things are gonna happen. And then it turns out, if you're curious, that if the pole were instead, the, if it were, say, 16 in the numerator, 25 in the denominator, and they were switched, then it would go in the opposite direction. The angle of arrival and departure would be switched, and this thing would be stable for all values of k, actually. So angle of arrival, angle of departure is the giveaway in this case for a very significant difference, and the, the issue is, is your zero of higher or lower frequency than your pole?